Shalom everyone and Shavua Tov. We are this week in Parashat Korach. As we learned in previous parashot, the book of Numbers, Korach is the fourth one, is full of troubles. Okay? It started beautifully. It was the first parasha, Parashat Bamidbar, was about raising everybody's head, making everybody important because you mean nothing when you're just by yourself. You always need people around you to become who you are, to support you, to uh, to be, you know, you, you have a business. You can't have a business by yourself. You need clients, right? You need suppliers. You can't produce something without somebody who sells it. You can't produce something without somebody bringing you the materials. You always need someone. So the Zohar said, why is it that always what you need, somebody else has? He didn't notice that? That... A lot of times you, you just need something and somebody else has it. Because the Zohar says, because somebody else has it, you have to learn to be nice to others. So they give it to you. The support, the product, whatever, because otherwise we'll be terribly selfish and miserable forever. And by learning to like other people, by caring to other people, by serving other people, by learning that other people are also important, not just you, you learn to get out of yourself. You know what happens? Who do you meet when you get out of yourself? God. He's there. But when you're full of yourself, there's no place for God. So it's a, either you or God. It's like you have to choose. But the moment you get out of yourself and you make space for, for God and his bliss. So this is very important to understand. So we have that in Parashat Bamidbar, raising everybody's head. You have it in Parashat Naso, raising everybody's head. Okay? You have in Parashat Baalotcha, raising everybody up. Okay? But in the middle of Parashat Baalotcha, people start to fall. And so you understand that the first three Parashot were giving us kind of an inoculation against falling. Raising us up because we learned that life Parashat Bamidbar, which means this, the whole book of Bamidbar, means in the desert. What do I mean you in the desert? You're just for yourself. You're just for yourself and you have to understand that life is not as you've seen it in the kindergartens. means grow up. It's not just you have to raise other people because you need them and you're not a whole without them. You have to understand that life is not just about fun. It's also, and majorly, about how do you deal with falling? How do we deal with failure? And we learned also that without failure, life is meaningless, according to Kabbalah. Why? Because King Solomon says, Sheva ipol tzadik vekam. A tzadik, a holy person, will fall seven times and will rise. An evil person will fall in one price. You blame the whole world. But as a revenge, he'll stay down. Because he's stupid. Because be, if being evil is being stupid because you're disconnected from the forces of life. So being good, and I say it again, I never met happy, selfish people. So it's very stupid to be selfish. Why? You're going to be miserable. You're going to blame the rest of the world. What you good? What, what, what's good in it? Nothing. It doesn't pay to be selfish. So the Torah is teaching us: you have to get out of yourself to be there for others. You're not doing anybody a, a favor by being there for them. You're just doing it for yourself. Okay. So then we learn that when you fall, and you already train yourself that falling is part of living. That falling is part of living. That when you fall, it's not about whether you're going to fall. You're going to fall if you're alive. You're going to make mistakes. The question is, how do you raise yourself up? How do you surround yourself with people that will raise you up? How are you going to realize that this is part of life and being connected to the tree of life is the ability to see that every falling is also an opportunity. This is important, as we're going to see. So in last parasha, we had a terrible fall, but we still pay the consequences 
it's Moses is sending 12 of the best people he knew to the Holy Land, to the Promised Land, to check it out, and 10 of them come out totally confused. So they simply confused the whole mission. Whatever they saw, they saw it on the dark side. They delivered the message, and the whole nation followed their message. Everybody felt it's the end of the world. So it says that it's like God said, you cried for nothing, I'll give you a reason to cry. That day was the 9th of Av, we're still crying on the 9th of Av. 34 centuries later, we still did not fix that falling. But at least we get up, we're not dead yet. Okay, a lot of nations died since then. Now, how many nations that lived 34 centuries ago are still alive, knowing their name, talking the same language, having the same tradition? No one. Only because we learned that falling is not the end. Falling is an opportunity to reveal light. You know, some people, you can see that their best moments, I'm saying some, I don't want to generalize, but it is. The best moments are the moments that we fall, experience a horrible time, but when we rise out of it, it becomes an experience. Why? Because we're here not in order to have it nice and smooth. We're here in this world for the challenges, to turn the darkness into light. Why? Being created in the image of God, he created the light. So we want to create light also. If nobody allows me to create light, what do I feel? Useless. How many times a day can I create light? Oh, that's so many days. Just you see somebody in despair, smile to him. Tell him a joke. Raise up his mood. You already created light. Correct? So easy. So easy. And it's like there's a tale. Rav Ashlag is telling this amazing tale about this guy. He was a total failure, loser. They sent him to this. We're talking about in very old times. They sent him to be an apprentice of a carpenter. Terrible. The guy threw him away. Of a, whatever, all these professionally, they tried, you know, give him a job. Training to be something. Good for no, nothing. So there's the whole family is getting together. What are we going to do with this uh, trouble? Somebody says, I have an idea. There is an island, three years sailing from our port. On that island, there are diamonds like sand. Let us send him to that island. He's no use over here. At least he's not going to be a problem. Get him a ticket. Go on the island. What's the big problem? To collect the diamonds, put it in, a, in boxes, and bring it home. And then all of us will be rich, and he will be proud. He made everybody rich. So three years sailing, three years coming back, six years, no problem. The guy agrees. He goes on the boat. The ship is sailing. Three years later, they land on the island, and it's true. He's there with the bags, collecting the diamonds, collecting the He's so excited that finally he's going to do something important. One of the locals passes by and tells him, you know, the ship just sailed. It's going to take years till it's coming back, you know, three years to sail, just making the round till it comes back. Who knows how many years it's going to be till the ship is coming back. Meanwhile, you have to make a living. And he can't sell diamonds to anybody over here. <laughs> right? So the guy said, what is that you need? So they said, we just, maybe you have the secret of candle making. There was a family. They held the secret of making candles. The last member of that family just died. We all sitting in the dark. The guy says, oh, my, I, of course, I'm an expert. You know, one of the times they sent him to be an apprentice of this candle maker. Of course, he made crooked candles, he threw him away. Okay, but the guy knows how to make candles, crooked. But, you know, when you have a captive audience, you have you are mono, monopoly, right? 
you, the market is yours. The guy started to make candles, became rich. He was one of the most important people on the island. Years later, the ship is coming. The ship is coming back. So he packs all the most precious stuff he had in, in his house, got on the ship and sailed back home. When he comes home, everybody closes the door shutters and whatever so nobody will see they open the boxes and piles of candles pour out the boxes what have you brought what what is that he said candles candles is that's the most expensive stuff in the world he said don't you know he said no we send you to bring diamonds where are the diamonds oh my god i forgot so what's the story about? The story is a story about our lives. We come to this world and we come to collect diamonds. Diamonds are those moments in every day's life that we can turn darkness into light, that we can turn something negative into positive, that we can be nice instead of being miserable or angry upset or critical those moments are the diamonds we send to this earth for nothing else however to make a living we need to collect all kinds of stuff that you need to live like furniture homes di candles physical diamond all kinds of stuff that people collect but you can take it with you it's worth nothing in the world to come but what is the diamonds those moments that stay forever that you turn dark moments into light moments they stay forever these are the diamonds you carry with you when is that you feel rich when you have bags of these diamonds when is it you feel poor when you have bags and boxes full of candles which means worldly acquisitions it doesn't last it doesn't stay and it's really not giving true happiness. 2008, there was a big crash in the economy, especially in the US. So the feds, together with MIT, made the research what really makes people happy. How much money does a person need in order to make happy? Because people have this hunger and thirst to get more and more money and people accumulated billions how much do you need to be happy and they found out that when you don't have enough to make a living getting a raise in your salary makes you really happy but when you already have enough to live the you know, mediocre living just comfortable not rich then raise in your salary does not make you happy anymore on the contrary the more money you get the more frustrated you are why it's called in kabbalah bread of shame It's the shame of receiving something you don't really need you didn't really earn it very simple so what makes people happy meaning what does mean meaning i'm here because i turn the darkness into light and that's meaning they have a reason to get up in the morning which is not just to survive okay that's about the story so that they found it out i don't think that they apply that issue still to the american economy and not to the world economy we still suffering because of people trying to accumulate what they don't really need okay and you know the economy is built on false base which means consume what you don't really need so people have households full of stuff they don't really need it and they don't have no place to store it so you know what's the biggest business growing right now storage places people have to store all that stuff they buy and they have no place in the house for right you know what i'm saying okay so this Persia brings us another story, terrible story, with a very similar message, 
but from a different direction. What does it mean? It means that we have to grow up this part of the year and starting to accept upon us that nobody ex expects us to be perfect. Nobody. We have to really assume position and to be, to be light upon the world around us. That's what we expect. That means to grow up and to really embrace who we are, what we are, what's our destiny, and what life is about. Okay? I remember the story years and years ago. It was in Florida. There was this lady. She started to come to my classes, and she was full of complaints. Why? She was 85 years old. And her family forced her to close her business that she built all her life in Philadelphia. She said, what for? I love to work. I said, no, you should go to Florida. You, you know what you're doing? Pressure, pressure, pressure. Finally, she sold the business and moved to Florida. She also said, like, you know, I'm sitting there playing cards. You're doing what? I want to like make business. I'm so frustrated of doing nothing. So, you know, I said, it's not making money, making business. It's not the only way to be happy. You can just make other people happy. The next week she's coming, she's shining. She said, you, you really saved my life. So what happened? I sat with the girls by the pool and we're talking. And then everybody was criticizing a lady that she was sitting the other side of the pool with a real sour face. And everybody was saying like, how dare she sit with such a sour face away from everybody else. This is really not nice. It's not a, it's not a behavior that can be accepted. And, and that lady I'm talking about, she said, but you taught me not to judge. So I said, I did an action. I got up, I went across the pool, and I went, sat next to that lady. I said, why are you so miserable? What happened? And the lady said, I just had a, a, a surgery in my back. I'm in terrible pain. I'm afraid to be with other people because I don't want to be bur a burden with my pain, but I'm in terrible pain. So that lady said, I went to my friend. I said, come over. We have somebody to make her happy. We told her jokes and we, and we did everything to get her out of her pain. And she was so happy and so relieved. And I also was relieved. And I, since then, I'm feeling so high because I made, you know, since then, I'm taking care of this lady. I'm making sure that she's not alone. And always somebody is telling her nice things so she can get out of her pain. Because we're here to create light. And that's what our job is. Okay? So, the story of this parasha is very tough. It says, Vaikach koach ben Yitzar ben Kiyad ben Levi. And the first word of the parasha is Vaikach. Vaikach, it's a verb. That means, and he took. It doesn't say what did it take. So the translations into foreign languages do not even translate this word. Why? Because what did it take? Later on, we will realize. Okay, but you know one thing. It's a bad omen. Why it's a bad omen? Because if you're here only to take, it's not going to be overwhelmed. Right? What do they say? You always start with the right foot. I mean, if I started with a left foot, it's a bad omen. No, starting with the right foot, we learn that it's starting with the right column. Every person has three columns. The right column is about sharing, caring, loving, chesed. The left column is about receiving, taking care of myself. I need a two. And the third one is balancing the two, which is the central column. You never start anything with the left column. You always start with the right column. I just say many times, you open a business, the first customer coming in, you don't tell him, give me your money. You ask him, how can I help you? How can I help you means right column or left column? Right, right column. I'm here to offer you help, right? You didn't open the business to offer you help. Him help. You open the business in order to make a living, right? But he never, approach someone with 
I want to take from you. Why? They shut down immediately, right? And there's no conversation, no relationship. Same thing, you're dating with somebody. You never tell them what you want from them. You're always there to share positivity because that's what everybody wants, right? Mm -hmm. If everybody goes and they meet with each other and everybody wants to take, it's a, it's not a market, right? There's no market. Buyer's market, there's no, there's no market. Okay, so, and then it says, Korach ben Itzar ben Kead ben Levi, Korach, the son of Itzar, the son of Kead, the son of Levi, which we can learn a whole thing about why those people are being mentioned. And the Tad Vadiran from the tribe of Uruvim, they got up in front of Moses. The Anoshim Ibn Yisrael, he created a whole coalition of 250 leaders of the nation. And they come to Moses. I'm reading in, in Numbers 16. They congregate, gather on Moses and Aaron. And they say to him, to them, Rav lachem. You've got enough, you guys. The whole nation, everybody is holy. God is in every, each one of us. It's all equality. They use the words we learn about raising. They use the same word. But in that context, it means patronizing. Why are you holding yourself high above the others? Who do you think you are? Verse 4. Moshe, and Moses heard, and he falls on his face. Then he gets up and he speaks to Korah. So the story is like this, that I'm, I'm not going, I'm going to explain later on, but first of all, the story. The story is like this, and he speaks to Korah and all his uh, group, and he says, Boker, morning will come, and God will tell, who is it? You want to be a Kohen? Each one of you wants to be a Kohen? No problem. Each one of you will make a pan and you'll bring an offering of incense in the temple tomorrow morning. Like the Kohen. And God will choose who should be the Kohen. What's terrible about it? They accept it. Okay. What's the problem with that? Just a few months earlier, there was a dedication of the temple. Remember that? It's in the Parashat Shmini in Leviticus. And it says over there, that as the glory of God sets on the tabernacle, the two sons of Aaron, Aaron's sons, the highest soul ever to walk on earth, couldn't hold themselves. Each one of them took a pan with incense and offered in the tabernacle. And they did it without being appointed to it. What happened to them? They were burned. Moses is telling them, look, each one of you, 250 people, take a pan in the morning, bring an offering of incense. Now, what should you say? Oh, no, no, no. You know, we've seen that a few months ago. It was not a thousand years ago. It was a few months ago. We've been there. We witnessed what happened if somebody is not appointed to the job. He brings an offering of incense. They vaporize. No, Moses, we're not doing it. They did it. And you know what happened to them? Same thing. They got burned. Smart, wise people. How did they do that? What makes people so blind? There's a great historian. Her name is Baba Tukman. She wrote a book. It's called The Parade of Folly. She describes a long history how great people made terrible, stupid mistakes. If anybody can say it's a mistake. And the question is, 
How do great people make mistakes? That you look at it, it's like, what made them do that? What made them do that? And we're not talking, we're not bad-mouthing those people. We're not even bad-mouthing Korach. Why? Because the Torah is not a telenovela. It's not a soap opera. We're not talking about these guys. Oh, have you heard what Sarah said to Abraham? Oh, it's like it didn't happen 4,000 years ago. People still get upset. I know people personally who still get upset about stuff that Sarah said and did. Hello, that was 4,000 years ago. People still do it. You know, like watching a movie. You know, you know it's a movie. It never happened. It's a movie. Still people get upset, they're excited, they cry. Right? We we love movies. Okay? So what's happening with us? And a story also about what happened to Korah. Because you know what Moses is saying. Moses is saying like this. In front of the whole nation of Israel. And he says as follows, uh, verse 29, chapter 16 in Numbers. Im kemot kol adam yimutun ele. If those people will die like regular death, like all people die. Ufkudat kol adam yipaked alehem. Lo ashev slachani, I'm not the messenger of God. However, if God is going to create a new creation, and the earth will open its mouth and swallow them up when whatever they have alive you would know that these people did the worst thing the word for it the verb that he's using it's a Hebrew word that sounds like Nazi Okay. Now the conjugate con, conjugate conjugation that is being used over here, ni atsu, which means these people cursed, blasphemed, did the worst thing with their behavior in a cold blood hatred. That's what it means. The word is nun alef tzadik, which is the source of the word Nazi. That's how he called them. You know what? God calls those people that badmouth Israel, last parasha, the same word. In a previous parasha, yesterday, same word. And as he's, and then verse 31, as he finished saying all of these words, but the Bakaha Adama and the earth cracked underneath them. But if Tahara the earth opened its mouth. Did you ever see earth mouth mouth? I didn't. Which is what does it mean? But if Lautam and the earth swallowed them up and their households and everything they owned. And nothing happened to the others. So it was not an earthquake. Because when it's an earthquake, the earth breaks. Everybody. No, only Korach and his people were influenced. Everybody else, nothing happened to them. Okay? And they went alive into hell. Chaim Sheola. But Chasalem out and the earth covered them. And they were lost from amongst the congregation. What are we talking about. What a terrible story. And first of all, who was Korach? And it says that Korach. Korach was Moses' cousin. He was a great man, one of the greatest, wisest people that was in among the Israelites. He was rich that even today, in Hebrew, when you say somebody is awfully rich, you say rich as Korach, right? The legend says that he owned one third of the wealth of the whole planet. Okay, more than that. He was a leader. He was a wise man. 
and it was one of the few that they were allowed to carry the Ark of the Covenant. Oh, what's your problem? What do you want to be? You want to be a high priest? What for? You have enough. What, what was missing? So, the Talmud is saying something like this, and that's a message we have to learn. Korach, he was, when we're talking about importance, he was after Moses. What does it mean? Levi, the son of Jacob, he had few sons. One of them, one of them was Kehat. He had four sons. Okay, Amram was the firstborn. So these two boys, his two boys, Moshe and Aaron, Moshe became officially the king. They didn't call him a king. He didn't need that. But he became, you know, basically he was the king. Aaron was the high priest. Now the second in line was. Amram's brother, Itzhar, Korach's father. Korach was the next, he was the firstborn of Itzhar. So, the Talmud is saying that what happened was that when Moses appointed Elitzafan ben Uziel, I think that was the name, to be the head of the tribe of Levi, Korach was offended. Why? He thought he's next. So my rabbi used to say, you know what does it mean? Koch had expectation, and that's what killed him. He thought he's supposed to be appointed as the head of the tribe. When he was not, he was offended. So, you know, the first thing to solve the problem is simply going to Moshe and say, Moshe, I expected that I'm going to be next. Like, tell me why did you decide to get our cousin to be the head of the tribe, yeah, I thought I was sure that I'm the next to get the honor of being the head of the tribe. So most will say, you know what? I have no idea. God told me to appoint him. And, you know, and look, you're so rich. You're carrying the ark. Why do you want to replace all of that with being the head of the tribe? It's like such a, well, it's like you don't have enough. You know, when you talk about stuff, then you get it off your chest. And it doesn't bother anymore. The problem is, when you're too wise and too smart to talk about it subconsciously, it starts to dig in you. It digs and it digs and it digs, like subconsciously. And you're upset. And you know what happens? It changes your outlook at everything. You start, why? Because deep inside, you start to say, so. If Moses elected my cousin to be the head of the tribe, he doesn't make good decisions. So you start to doubt the whole decision-making process of Moses. You know what's the problem with that? The whole Judaism is based on the five books of Moses that there's not even one little iota that is not in place. Now you're starting to doubt Moses. You become opinionated, you're starting right now to think that everything Moses is doing is wrong because you're hurt. And you don't even realize that you have this bug, this virus digging inside and starting to get all your brain infiltrated with the, the worst disease, which is called splitting. Arguments resentment that can kill the smartest wisest person in the world because the moment this virus takes over your brain computer it's good for nothing how do you know look what happened to god he simply dug his own grave how he came to resolutions that are so off but what, what made him do that? The resentment. The resentment. He could not get it. So we learned a few things. First of all, we're better off without expectations. What does it mean expectations? We should have expectations. We should have hope that life is going to be better 
And when we work harder, life is going to become better. But how will that become better? Don't have too much, don't limit. What does it mean? You know, they say in English, you, you, you better watch what you're asking for because you might get it. How many times we dream about something, we, we convince everybody we want that something, we get that something, oh my God, what did I do? Right? Because one of the most important skills in life is to realize, as we spoke about in the last few weeks, that the way I perceive reality, if I'm really doing a spiritual job in my life, has an expiration date. Why? Because you're really doing a good job, for sure, within a year, two years, a lot of stuff that you think these are the true thing, reality, <laughs> how could I be so stupid and think that this is right? Correct? So, Perception, limit, it's, it's, it's limited. It's like, I don't know how long would I still believe that this is right and this is wrong. That that's the way we should do it. You know, if you're really a good business person, any industry, you're always trying to improve. And what does it mean? That you reinvent yourself. What does it mean reinventing yourself? then you don't have the same outlook at life as you had before, right? A lot of stuff that you consider them holy and precious looks like a burden after a while, right? You have to discard them in order to get bigger and to grow up. And part of growing up is a lot of kind of belief systems that you have to get rid of. We know it's hard, but that's what's making you a person. And not a little child that is sticking to the same stories of the kindergarten. Right? And that means that the only expectation we should have is the expectations, as it says, Yagata or Matsata Tamin. When you make an effort and you put your energy in and you try hard, you will be rewarded. How? Rabbi Akiva says in Ethics of the Fathers, Yagata or Matsata. So Rabbi Ashla explains, Yagata means you make the effort. Logically, you make the effort, you should acquire, should be Yagata Vikanita. Right? You have a goal, you acquire your goal. You earn it, right? Why does it say Metzia? You know what Metzia is? Something you bump into. Something you didn't figure out. Oh, what a Metzia. I never planned to find something like this. You understand what I'm saying? This because the greatest discoveries happened when people bumped into it, right? It looked like a coincidence, an accident. That's the greatest discoveries. Why? You were planning A and you got B. And you know what? B was much better than A. Only when you were open enough to see B coming. Otherwise, you just get so upset you didn't get A without realizing A is not good for you. So when you really put the effort with a real faith that putting the effort will get you to the right place, you usually get to B and not to A. Why? As I said before last week, a lot of people say, no, I'm going to make the effort when I really know what's the truth. And as all says, who do you think you are? You deserve to know who's, what's the truth. What do you think? That's for everyone? The Zohar says, for free, you get only troubles. Everything else you have to work for. Right? So, who do you think you are? You're going to get to know the truth. You have to earn it. And what does it mean? Whatever you believe is the truth and the right thing to do, you have to do it with a full heart and full effort. You know what will happen? By this you earn to see a bigger picture. What will that do? It will kill your old truth and replace it with a new truth. But will that truth be forever? No. If you continue walking and trying, you know what will happen? You'll earn a broader outlook at life and then you realize how miserable was and meek 
was the old one. Isn't that the way life works? So who do you think you are going to be able to, to know the truth? So you want the truth, you have to earn it. So that's why it says, Rabbi Akiva is saying, you make the effort. You bump into the new reality, the new truth. It will be like coming out of nowhere. No, it didn't come out of nowhere. It came as a result of your effort. So don't embarrass yourself by the gambling and betting on what you believe is the truth. Why? That has an expiration date, hopefully. But, you, but there's one truth that you cannot, that you cannot give up. That God is good and everything is for the good. This is absolute truth that you cannot deny. You know what happens? If you say, I'm going to make my best efforts, and because of that, I'm going to earn a better life, how would it look like? I have no idea. Why? Who am I to know? Who am I to know? It's like people say, what's the best way to communicate with another person 30 years ago? Well, people tell you, you know, you should take this little plastic and you can just, you just click on a button and then you can talk video live with somebody else. A simple smartphone that you buy to your child has more power capacity than state computers 30 years ago, right? It has access to more information that the top computer of IBM 30 years ago could, could achieve. And by the way, you could not click. You had to put these, remember these cards? You have to puncture and then you have to put them into the uh, hundreds of cards inside the computer and get this like papers with all kinds of symbols that only special people could read and interpret. You remember that? Who, would, who could imagine? You can hold something that has all access to all of you, of mankind's history and, uh, and, and information for the last, last thousands of years. And, and the, the amount of the information is, is keeping accumulating, right? So who am I to know how the future is going to look like, especially mine? I know one thing, how do I earn the best future? So the moment I have an expectation, you know, I need to be the head of the tribe of Levi. Big mistake. Are we criticizing Korach? No. Why? A, we don't know him. B, we are not in his league. The guy was in the level that we can only dream about reaching that level. But what the Torah is showing us? Nobody is immune of making mistakes. Nobody. Even the people with the smartest, the highest IQ. The moment you're alive, it means that you're human. It means you're making mistakes. And that's okay. It's okay to make mistakes. The question is, don't be too serious about a mistake. Mistakes are there to be repaired. Okay? You know what, when you repair the mistake, you learn stuff that without the mistake, will you will never know. And sometimes, years later, months later, sometimes minutes later, somebody comes to you with a question and now you know the answer, why? Because you made a mistake, you failed, you got up and now you know what to tell him. Never happened to you? Well, how come you're asking me? I just, I just learned it on my own self, just the last day. And you're asking me about the same question? Now I know why. Don't be too serious about what you think is the truth. Because again, you then you're going to ashamed yourself. But what happens? The moment you have that mistake and you're not rising to the occasion, you're not raising your consciousness because to say, you know, if I was not appointed to that job, there must be good I have nothing against Moses. Why? Does he decide about me? No, who decides about me? There's only one who decides about what's happening to me. That's a guy. Okay? Nobody else can decide about my destiny. And if the person was allowed to do that, okay, I accept it. 
I do my best. And what people do, the sages are saying, no one can lift even his little finger unless it's being appointed from above. Okay, I have to do my best. But that means that I cannot blame other people. And blaming other people is wrong because blaming other people is appointing them as my God. That is a terrible mistake because that leads you into idol worshiping. Why? Mount Sinai revelation. The first thing was, I am God, your Lord, who took you out of the land of Egypt from the house of slavery. Where's the mitzvah over here? Where's the mitzvah? The mitzvah is the biggest mitzvah of them all. You're not a slave anymore. Did you get it? Do you agree? Yes, we can talk. No, nothing to talk about. You know, no agreement. Why? Because a slave is exempt of all the mitzvot. You don't agree. So the moment you say that somebody decides for me, then you are his slave. Oops, 612 mitzvot in the Torah are not relevant to you. Why? Slaves, you didn't accept the first one. All the rest, none of your business. You're a slave. So in order for that, you have to assume total responsibility for what's happening to you. It's nobody's fault. And then the next one says, you should not have any idol upon me, right? And they say, but you know, I don't pray to idols. Yeah? They say, the Talmud says that anger is like idol worshiping. The moment I start blaming, I become a slave. Slaves let anger take over. Masters do not allow the anger to take over. And when the anger takes over, as I said, you start to think crooked, right? What I, that's the worst, you know, computers have viruses. Humans have a virus called anger. The moment you are angry, your intelligence freezes and disappears. You're stuck. And if the anger is not being resolved, you get stuck for a long time. And that's what happened to Korah. So the Zohar explains it as following. Uh, just before that, when Moses falls, why did Moses fall? Says the Orah Chaim, Rabbi Chaim ben Atav. Moses, the moment they blamed him, the first thing that he asked himself, maybe they're right. Let's check it out. So when he fell on his face, he fell in submission to Korach. I'm willing to bow down to you guys to show you that I'm not, I had no idea that that hurt you and I didn't do it in purpose. God told me. So it's not my ego. It's not my sense of honor that I'm making decisions for other people's lives. And I'm willing to show it by bowing down, bowing down to you. He also, when he bowed down, he checked his heart. Did I make that decision from the wrong place? To, let's say, humiliate Korach. And he checked it in, deep inside. Couldn't find anything. Korach, I, I, I didn't do it to humiliate you, to hurt you. That's the right thing. And you should expect it, accept it. But then, after he cleared the issue, he could prophesy to Korach what will happen to him. Why? Says this, the Zohar as follows. <clears throat> the, to the Zohar starts, I'll make it short because we don't have so much time left. And the Zohar says, the words of the Torah are so divine, so precious, because they are the holy name of God. You know, there's a saying that the whole Torah is the name of God. So whenever you study the Torah, you're dealing with the name of God. What does it mean? Whoever is occupying himself with the Torah. Okay? He's being saved in this world and in the world to come. Whereas we said before, the Zohar again answers a big a big discussion that a lot of rabbis are discussing. If you are following the Torah, is your reward in this world or in the other world? 
you know, Dark Ages was, it's another world, <laughs> right? You know, prove it. <laughs> prove it. You can't prove it. You just have to do what it says so. But the Zohar says, no, the reward in this world. Why? The moment, the Zohar says, Kol Misho Sek Batua, who is ever dealing with the Torah, which whatever he's doing, he's applying the consciousness of the Torah in what he's doing. He's connected to the tree of life. What's the reward of connecting to the tree of life? The moment you're connected to the tree of life, you do not fall. And if you fall, you pick like yourself like this. Why? Because connection to the tree of life means that your, con your consciousness is always focused on God's light. And if you didn't get the job, you say, must be for the good. Probably this job was not for me. Must be that God is, is preparing for me something better than that. I just have to work harder. You know what? Even if it's not literally the truth, that saved you from being insulted and fall. Right? It saved you from being angry. It changes your life quality forever. Right? You know, a lot of people, I know that a lot of my students who study, you know, a lot of people have road rage. You know what I'm talking about. When you really study Kabbalah, you get rid of the road rage. Why? What for? Why should they get upset? Somebody made a mistake. Now I have to kill myself because he made a mistake. Huh? How does that sound like? Now that you're talking, you know, I didn't think about it this way. But you should. Not just on the road, everywhere. So every time you save yourself from being upset, angry, uh, humiliated, whatever, you just maybe added another year or two or three to your life. Because every time the Zohar says we get upset and disappointment, we, you, you die a little bit. You get your life shorter. So the Torah, it's a, and that means also that if somebody says something wrong, instead of being hurt and saying something stupid, you're not getting hurt. One game. Two, you don't lose your marbles. You know what to say. You know how to deal with that. As a, as a, you know, you use your experience, you use your wisdom, whatever, in order to deal with the issue. That's a reward. Big reward. Huge reward. How do you see yourself after you dealt something like this with calm and balance and you found the right answer to say without anyone making a mess out of it. Oh, that feels great, right? Does that, is that, isn't that a reward? And by the way, is there a bigger reward than that? Feeling great about yourself? Saying like, make my day, give me another opportunity. Then you're not afraid of people. You're not afraid of people saying, something terrible because okay you get the self it's called self-esteem true self-esteem not fake that's enough as a reward it changes your life quality how do people relate to you when you start becoming such a person that never get hurt never get upset Always says there must be a good reason for that. Always have a smart, wise, something beautiful to say about what happened. How do people relate to you? Huh? That's giving you a status. That you get respect. You know, they say in Hebrew, you want respect, you have to work for it. No free lunches. So now, when we got the Torah, says the Zohar, we got, and it says on the tablets, there was you could read Chavut in grade, but it says, really Chavut? Freedom on the tablets. Freedom from what? From death. Every time we get upset, we die a little bit. The moment, the more spiritual you become, you pick yourself up as you fall and you save yourself another death. Right? And by the way, what happens to our immune system when we lose it? Oh, terrible. Right? So, come and see, verse 3, something very important. 
Aaron is Aaron, Aaron, the priest, the Kohen, was the right color. He was representing on this world the energy and the power of the right column, chesed, loving kindness. Why? Was he born like this? No. He worked all his life to be that person that symbolized God's love on earth. That's why God has no other choice. And when they needed a Kohen Gadol, it was only Aaron who could be the Kohen Gadol. He brought him up to that, says the Zohar, right? In Parashat Emo. Now, he is now a Kohen. He was born a Levite, right? But now he's a Kohen. But the Levites are left color. The Zohar says everywhere. Who were the two people who killed the whole people of Shechem? Levi and Shimon. Judgment. But they divide. Levi is a lenient, soft judgment. Shimon is a harsh, deep judgment. That's why Shimon never got a place in Israel. His families were scarce among the tribe of Yehuda. Levi got out of it by becoming the tribe of holiness. But they still left Kalam. It's soft judgment. So, judgment, you need for judgment, you need to bring music to the world. The Levites were bringing the music. Right? Because music, what happens when you hear good music? You start to feel the fire in your veins, right? In your arteries. But that's a good fire. Why? When it's good music. Bad music turns a dark fire. That's why you know when you play music to cows, if it's positive music, they make more milk. If it's a metal music, less milk, right? So what we happen? What happens to us when we listen to music that is uh, composed and sung? by people are full of anger. You know, some people love that kind of music. Mm -hmm. It's not really productive. It is music that is created to awaken the fire of passion towards life inside you. That's where the Levites came in. They turned that passion on, that excitement on. The Levites were left column. However, the rule is like this, that in our world, Says the Zohar, the left, the judgment has to be always conditioned and controlled by the right. Which means every time you have judgment, it has to be conditioned and controlled by chesed, my love. Otherwise, it can kill you. And that's the story of the binding of Isaac. Abram symbolizes the energy of chesed, Isaac the energy of vua, judgment. So when Abram is binding him, he creates a solution that how you can connect to judgment, to fire, only when you impose chesed and love upon it. That is a binding contract. Now comes Korah. And because he was, he had that bug, that virus of resentment, his whole brain started to, you know, he was a smart guy, very wise. Well, as I said, we can't even dream being in his league. But the moment he did not deal with that bug, to show that no one is immune. No one can think, oh, I will never fail. Koach failed. He failed. Who am I? I, am I have like the, the tendency, the ability, the probability to fail so many times more than Koach. So always be careful. But Korach, he wanted that the left column, that the judgment will overrule, that the judgment will become number one and the chesed will become number two. That is changing the rules of the universe. He found a way to just justify it. You know how we, you know, first we decide what we're going to do, then we bring the logic to justify it. You know how people work? First you make a decision, then you bring the logic why. Okay, be careful about it. Because if you find inside yourself, while making the decision that yeah, I'm angry, I'm upset, I'm hurt, don't trust yourself. I'm not just, trust yourself that you're going to hurt yourself, you continue on the same road. 
okay? So Korach made one big mistake by, by not sharing with Moses his resentment and by not dealing with it and not taking over that. One mistake. But one mistake leads to another. The result, he wanted that the left column will take over the right column. It's an important time already. Mashiach time is coming. Now, we all create, what did God create for us for us? To share or to receive? One of the major sayings as a rule cause for the creation was that that the whole purpose of the creation is to do good to the creation. In order to good, do good to good do good to the creation, the creation needs to want that good. So we were created to receive the good from God. The problem is. If you just receive, if you only take, you get burned. So we learn how to give so we can continue receiving. But the ulterior, the very real motive, the real goal is that we will be happy if we receive. Cross said, you know, we're here to receive. Left column is more important. You know, Moshe is around. We are like 12 tribes. We're united. Now we can put the real truth in front of everybody. We're here to receive. Receiving comes before giving. Wrong decision. The moment he did that, he awakened the darkest forces of the creation. And one of them was called the mouth of the earth. So when Moses was saying, if those people will die a normal death, I am not God's messenger. He just said something very important. Who is wise, who can see the outcome of the event. Moses saw, if Korach pushed the button of putting the left column above the right column, putting the Vaikach first, I am here to take before I am here to give. Starting with the left foot. He rose up the dormant power that the Talmud says that, that the Midrash saying that power, there were 10 forces that were part of the creation, but they were created just before Shabbat got in. And as Shabbat got in, these were unfinished business. They were hanging there, loose, but Koach walked them up. One of them, the one that Korach woke up about that left column without the right column, is called the mouth of the earth. The way it's described, it says that the, the Midrash is saying that even if there was a lady in the camp of Israel that she borrowed a needle from another lady that was part of Korach's camp, that was sucked in from her house, to the mouth of the earth it opened. It, sounded, it like, looked like a, how do you call it, science fiction movie with its wormholes that open up and suck things in and then it closed. And where was it? You can't find it. You can't go after it. That was the mouth of the earth. It was another creation that Koch sucked himself into by operating the left column without the right column. That was a big mistake. How did that happen? The Zohar says, because Korach halach v'machloket. He took a bad advice. He disputed. He chose dispute. Not dispute as brainstorming. Dispute comes from the place that you are wrong and I prove it to you. That's not brainstorming. That's dispute. This is not arguing for the sake of finding a higher truth. Which means, I can be wrong, I can be partially right. You know, I can see a bigger truth by arguing. That's a positive argument. But that was not his argument. He wanted to prove Moses wrong because he had this agenda. He was hurt. He was hurt and he couldn't overcome that hurt. And the result is, says, whoever is chasing and trying to acquire what doesn't belong to him, 
it will run away from you. It's not yours, it's not yours. Not just this as well, you're going even to lose what you have when you're focusing on somebody else's. Why? Because you want the glory, you want the fame, you want... Is that what you want? Or you want to feel good? And how do you know what... You know, the worst thing is when people try to get a job that are not qualified for. Well, they're doing their job very well. So you don't, it's becoming, you're not, you don't want to do your job, you want the glory that the other job is giving. You don't really want the job, you want the glory and the fame. That should already sound the alarm that you're going to hurt yourself because you're going to lose what you have. You're going not to get what you want. And a lot of people do that without realizing. Korach lost what he had. He didn't take it with him. Right? He took it. He couldn't enjoy it. You know, what can you buy in hell? Okay? With all the fortune he took with him. Nothing. You know, in the world to come, they say there's a joke. In the cafeteria, in the other world, you can buy only with what you gave. It's the only thing. Okay? It's only currency that is available. Koch halach b'machloket, but Koch did even something worse than that. He chose dispute. Dispute is rejection. That's what dispute is about. Because the moment you are in a dispute consciousness, you're being rejected from the upper world. And you're being rejected from God's name, because God's name is Shalom. Now, you know, the two words. In English, the word peace, I don't know if you know, but it's a Hebrew word. Peace means two people are fighting with each other. And then when you when you make them not fighting with each other, it's called lefayes. Lehafis. It means don't fight with each other. You know, but they don't fight anymore. But they don't talk to each other. Okay, you know what? It's better than a war. It's a cold peace, but it's not peace. It's a peace. In English or in Hebrew, it's the word peace, they don't fight. But the Hebrew word is shalom. Shalom comes from the word shalem. Shalem means that you see the other person, not just you don't want to fight with him. You see that you are not a whole without him. So how can you dispute him? He's part of you. You're part of him. You're not a whole without him. That is shalom. When you have shalom, you can't turn your back to somebody because he's part of you. What, what do you do? He's like, what are you losing? You're, you're stupid. Shalom is one of the names of God. Because God is about the whole. So when you are in dispute, you're rejecting yourself from God, from Shalom. And whoever disputes Shalom disputes the holy name of God. Come and see. The whole world exists only on Shalom. When there is Shalom, there's functionality. When there's no Shalom, no functionality. Even if, you know, there's a whole factory. They don't fight, but they just don't cooperate, cooperate with each other. That's the end of it, right? So you achieve peace, but it's still dysfunctional. Only Shalom is functional. Okay, Shalom is that you see that I, how can I hate this guy that I can't live without him? Am I stupid? Am I crazy? It's like cutting off my hand. Yeah, but my hand is not functioning that well. Okay, so go to the doctor. You do your best in order for your hand to function better. You don't cut your hand off because it's not functioning so well. Right? And what is Shalom? Shalom is Shabbat. That's why the first letter of the word Shabbat is Shin. How do you write a Shin? Like this. Three Vav. Why three Vav? Vav is six. Three times six is 18. Chai. When you have a wholeness, then the bliss, the energy of life streams into your life. So Shabbat was there and came there. Just to bring the whole world that is separated into many, many, many parts into one whole. And that's why we have Shabbat. 
So in Shabbat, we can get back to our senses and to all of this, like so many, many things that split between us and among us, we can turn it back into a healthy state of mind of tree of life. And that's what Shabbat is about. No, it's, not, it's not about not doing things. It's about bringing the spirit of wholeness into yourself, of Shalom. So, Shalom upon all of us. Thank you, and have a great week. Shalom.